Okay. Um, so we're now talking about uh, Jiva Goswami. Okay, Jiva Goswami. Um, so this is uh, this is now in the tradition of Bhakti slash Vedanta. <clears throat> Actually, this weekend, there's a really good scholar coming to the Mountain View Temple, Ravi M. Gupta, who's written two books uh, and several articles about the relationship between uh, Vedanta and Chaitanya Bhakti Vaishnavism, right? Um, it's a very, very, very interesting thing how all of these intellectual movements kind of agitate. In my feel, it feels like such an explosion of energy to me to watch how Bhakti emerges out of this mix of Mahayana Buddhism with Tantra, with uh, Vedanta, this like really, this like there's this intellectual agitation, and it feels to me like it just kind of breaks into bhakti. It's almost like the dam just breaks. It's kind of the feeling when you start looking at this. Um, so this is where Jiva Goswami is. I mean, he's well into this, you know, explosion do you, do of you, the bhakti movement. Do you mean in some ways bhakti is kind of born out of all of this? Yeah, 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 this? yeah, exactly. And the agitation from all of this, it may even be like a, may even be like kind of a populist response, you know. In a sense, uh, Tantra, part of what Tantra does is it starts to reject the religious norms and create this counter-normative transgressive practices which we think of when we associate with Tantra. It's not, we tend to focus on that too much when we study Tantra. But that questioning of the uh, norms, you know, and of course the norms are ascetic norms, you know, like desire's bad, period. You know, Trishna, Raga, these kind of words are completely bad, right? And then Bhakti kind of goes, you know, well, actually, if you're really Vairagya, if you're really non attached, then you should be non attached to. Raga and Dvesha, even well, as well as being above Raga and Dvesha. And so they start going into Dvesha. The thing that you're averse to, that's the thing we should be doing. And Tantra kind of does that. And then in a sense, Bhakti kind of goes, whoa, Tantra. Not to say that Bhakti is not, it's, it's pretty much a Tantric movement in a lot of ways, you know. But in a sense, certain schools of Bhakti will kind of say, whoa, Tantra, you guys are going way too far with this, you know. We're going to accept the criticism. There, Raga and Dvesha and, and Trishna and these kind of things are not always bad. We're going to accept that. However, we're going to uh, put it square in the middle of theology. We're going to say that, yes, Raga and Dvesha are still bad when we talk about material world, but they're not absolute morality. They're not absolutely bad. Because if you have Trishna for the Lord, if you have Raga for the Lord, then that's good. So in a sense, they kind of take, you know, if the one extreme is that all the ascetic practices that start, you know, for a thousand year period between 500 before the common era and 500 into the common era, asceticism and renounce and desire and kind of this shanti, nirdhoda sort of idea really dominates the scene, you know. Around 500 it starts to kind of crack down a little bit with the tantra stuff and then the philosophical schools get start getting really intense the Buddhists start getting much more atheist ick. You know, you can't really, I don't want to call Buddhists atheists, but certainly when you start getting the, like, the, um, uh, the Dignaga, Dharmakirti, Chandrakirti, these kind of guys, uh, Shantarakshita, and then the uh, uh, Kamalashila commentaries on that, you know, these, these Mahayana Buddhists start denouncing the soul and denouncing Ishwara with the force this previously unheard of in Buddhism. Like, it's much more forceful. Uh, and because of that force, it's almost like the Brahmanical establishment has to respond with the Phyllis. Because, you know, these, these Buddhist thinkers are brilliant. They are brilliant uh, log, log, logicians. Logician, I think, is the word. They're brilliant logicians, right? Logicians? I'm not sure, but they're really Logician. good with their logic. I mean, they have got some powerful argumentation. And uh, so what happens is the Hindus kind of have to respond in kind with what becomes Vedanta and keep in mind that Vedanta is a... So this becomes like the philosophical response to the uh, philosophies of the Mahayana Buddhists. Um, and then also there's kind of like the cultural responses 
to Tantra, you know, I guess I could say, and this may be a really bad generalization, but it's this is a helpful way, of, like a heuristic device. This is a helpful way of thinking about it, even if it's not 100, you don't grip to it too tight. But it seems as though Vedanta is a philosophical response to Mahayana Buddhism, and Bhakti is maybe a response to both Tantra and asceticism. It's kind of like almost a compromised position, okay? Just in terms of conceptually, this is a good way to think about it. Because, you know, if you have extreme asceticism, renounce and desire on one hand, and then you have the like, let's do the very thing that we're adverse to on the other hand with Tantra, then really Bhakti becomes the kind of middle and the, it becomes a way of renouncing um, desire uh, in the context of uh, devotionalism to God. Okay, so this is what's happening here in this movement where Chaitanya is uh, coming to the foreground, okay? So Chaitanya, I believe, is uh, born in 1433 and dies sometime in the 1500s, uh, I'll say like 1580, I don't know. I doubt that long. <laughs> that would be way too long. But, you know, it's like 1400s to 1500s where Chaitanya comes on the scene. And, um, <clears throat> and he's deep into this battle between Mahayana Buddhism and Vedanta in which Vedanta is increasingly the victor of that battle, right? As a matter of fact, the force of Chaitanya's rhetoric is directed against, or at least the Chaitanya school, uh, is directed against other Vedantins much more than it is the Buddhists. The Buddhists are not really as much of a threat, so they don't warrant as strong of reaction. The big thrust of Chaitanya Vaishnavism is against Advaita, right? So Advaita comes onto the scene as this almost, uh, Srila Prabhupada actually calls Advaita Buddhism, a form of Buddhism. <laughs> and, and, and if you think about it, just like in basic concept, if Buddhism tells you that everything's empty and Advaita tells you that everything is one, those are kind of not that far apart philosophically. Either one of those is telling you that the fact that you're an, uh, an individual self is an illusion. And to say that everything is one and everything is none is kind of almost the same statement because if nothing is a something in itself, then that something could be a one just as easily as it could be a zero. Right? If we're going to talk about zero, zero, zero must be a thing that we can talk about. It must be have some kind of existence, uh, you know, or maybe it's non-existent, but whatever. You can see that it's very conceptually similar in the sense that we're obliterating the sense of self completely in either one of these. So, you know, uh, you know the later Vedantins will look at, non-Advaitic Vedantins, will look at the school of Shankar and they'll be like, well, he's just kind of really Hinduizing what the Buddhists are doing, you know. In a sense, the Buddhist rhetoric against Ishwarda and against the Atman is kind of incorporated by Advaita. You know, yeah, there's no God, there's no soul. You're right. It's all one, you know. But we're going to call that oneness God's soul, you know. I mean, it's almost like a semantic argument, really, at that point. I mean, conceptually, it's not that dissimilar than the Buddhist arguments, right? But then, of course, there's those within the Hindu school who are not willing to go that far, not willing to compromise that far with the Buddhists. You know, if you could see Adi Shankar and... You know, there's earlier Advaita, but Shankar is the one who really brings Advaita onto the scene. You know, there's, there's schools of Hinduism that are not willing to compromise God and the soul. You know, it, it, it starts making, a, it doesn't make sense to worship a God that you're already one with, you know, is the argument. It doesn't make sense to have, you know, it, it seems very self-serving to love that kind of God, you know. So, you know, they want to maintain a sense of separateness. And then also there's like this, this basic epistemological argument. Yeah, yeah, we can with logic all day long prove that everything's one. But then by the time our conversation is done, I'm going to say, so you want to go out for coffee? And you're going to either say yes or no, and you're going to act like you're a completely independent, autonomous being. So you like, I don't care how much logic you make this make sense. When push comes to shove, we're still separate. <laughs> you know, it's like arguments against free will. I can convince you that you don't have free will, but then you're going to choose whether you accept my arguments or not. You know? <laughs> you know, I choose to accept that. You know, so um, so there becomes this epistemological conflict, right? And um, and uh, there's there's a statement that I read in a in an article I was reading recently. It was talking about uh, Western philosophy, and I can't quite remember where it happened, but. Either there's a point in the 19th century, I don't know Western philosophy very well, but there's a point in either the 19th century or the 20th century where the statement said that the arguments about selfhood shifted from ontological arguments to epistemological arguments. Right? And this sounds very similar to what I always say about the hyperbolized archetypal construct. You know, the idea that when we're talking about self, 
we may not necessarily be having an ontological uh, argument. If I'm telling you that you are separate individual selves that are different from God, I may not actually mean that in the sense that like we can prove that objectively. We can measure this. We can prove this is a fundamental truth the same way an atom has protons, neutrons, and electrons, or better yet, maybe the way molecules are made or something, you know. I may not mean that statement is the same kind of truth as that. It may be an, ex, uh, an epistemological truth. An epistemological truth, instead of it being an objective, ontological truth where I'm stepping outside and looking at the truth objectively, that's kind of what's happening with ontology, right? That's what ontology is. If I'm out here looking in and saying, this is how shit works. It may be an epistemological truth, but an epistemological truth is kind of a subjective nature of experiential analysis where you're kind of going, how do I know this is true? My direct experience, my inference, or what I, how what people are telling me except, uh, affects my experience, right? So it's almost like this kind of shift from the uh, objective to the subjective. How is, how is that different from that? Phenomenological. It is phenomenology. It's the same thing. Yeah, that's where phenomenology comes from, right? Epistemology. Yeah, yeah, it becomes like a... Well, you know, phenomenology... The terms come from Kant, right? Phenomenology, noumenology, right? Um, but, uh, but there's a certain point where you can understand yourself objectively or you can understand yourself subjectively, you know? Objectively be like, what is my place and relationship to these other things? It's like you're stepping outside. It's like, how do I feel today? Right? This is, again, the reflective versus reflexive. How do I feel today? Right? Or there's a way of understanding truth that's experiential, you know, which is, this is what I'm feeling. You know? it's, and again, this is, this, is, uh, this is kind of in the uh, argument of which is better epistemology, direct experience, or logic, because logic is a reflective process. You step outside of things and you think about them. You create a model. It's an objective process. You're looking at the model, right? Versus direct experience is, I am the model. <laughs> there is no model, right? That's the, supposedly the argument, right? You know? So I'm still not clear on the, the distinction between phenomenology and epistemology. <clears throat> I wish you would have asked me that three days ago when <laughs> I just read that. Um, I'm trying to remember what, um, what Kant is saying when he's talking. Okay, this is Kantian philosophy, okay? And I really don't want to get too deep into this. But what Kant is arguing is that there's a thing in itself, which is called noumenology, right? A thing in itself. That means that apart from our experience of reality, there is a reality that exists without the experiencer. The tree still falls in the forest and makes a sound, whether anybody's there or not. Right? That's called a thing in itself, and that's called noumenology. And what Kant says is he says, who cares? He says, you can never know that. You know, It's worthless to spend your time thinking about what sound does the tree make if nobody's there. You can never know it. You can only know things from the frame of your own experiences. That's phenomenology as opposed to noumenology. Noumenology is the idea of a realist reality where things exist apart from your experience of them. You know, Kant says we don't even know if that can really happen because our ability to understand that is based on our own experience. We're assuming the very thing that's called into question, you know, petitio principi, right? You know? We can't really, so why even, don't even talk about it. Like, just get off that, you know. We can only understand world through our own experience of it. And therefore, the only real apodictic statements that we can make are based on our own experience, our own phenomena, like our own mental phenomena. And he goes so far as to say that the mind itself is also a thing in itself that's a, a, a nominal, right? That means that it's, it's something that we can't understand apart from our experience of it. We only know the mind by experience, and we just kind of like assume that there's something back there making that happen, but we actually can't really know what, what it is. So that's where phenomenology comes from, right? Now, can you look at that objectively or subjectively? Well, you can't really look at it objectively because in a sense you'd be treating your experience as a thing in itself, so you're actually not knowing it apart from the experience. Again, this keeps coming back to petitio principi. You're still, you're still knowing the thing 
you know, it's the data and the conclusion are supporting each other. You're assuming the conclusion and the data and the data and the, you know, you can't, you can't do it. You just can't do it. You know, it's a, it's a complete fallacy. You know, this is one of the, it's a pretty powerful argument that uh, Kant makes. And it becomes like a, a certain um, uh, agnosticism, right? A certain agnosticism whereby it's like, I don't know. How can you know? That's what agnostic means. So I don't know. How can I know? <laughs> don't talk to me about the sound of the tree in the forest with nobody experiences. No way. I'm, even me talking about that is through the lens of my own experience. You know, there's no so way. So then, does phenomenology deal nothing with uh, possible death or after death? That kind of well, because because that too is the, is unknowing. Well, unknown. You know, I think Kant would say that if it's not part of your experience, then you can't deal with it. You know, I mean, of course, we're all going to experience that at some point. Maybe we've already experienced that. I don't know, but unless you can somehow experience that. It just becomes this very, very kind of pessimistic appraisal of reality whereby your experience is all you can really know. And then guys get so crazy with that that they start turning this all the way into this strongly atheistic position that like that turns into nihilism. Because you know, in a sense, nihilism and atheism are not that far apart um, where you actually can't know even your own experiences. It starts getting to that point. And then, of course, what do you want to do if you want to be the good guy in the room? You take two guys who are arguing, and you used to tell the third story, and that's what Hegel comes along and does. And he gives us a similar achintya uh, beda beda tattva sort of thing here. So this is where Hegel comes in, right? And so this is uh, what I was, I was explaining to Hegel to somebody the other day, and I was saying, look, when we're studying Jiva Goswami's theology, I want you to keep thinking about Hegel's dialectic, right? Hegel's dialectic is thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Right? It sounds just like Achintya Veda Veda Tattva. You're simultaneously separate, you're simultaneously different, and you're both. Right? Synthesis, right? Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is the idea that, uh, that something happens. And he, they, he explains this through like a leaf growing on a tree. The thesis is the leaf grows. Right? Then the leaf dies and gives way to another leaf. That's the antithesis is it dying. And then the synthesis is that it's both part of the same process. Even though new old leaf and new leaf are thesis and antithesis, they're separate, they're still synthesis in that they're both based on the same thing. And this is called Hegel's dialectic, right? What does this sound like? Achintya beda beda tapa, right? You are simultaneously separate from God, you're one with God, and you're both those. Somehow it's achintya. It's, it's, and, and, and it's stated as achintya, but in a way, Hegel kind of takes that achintya status away from it with a very compelling uh, philosophy. Um, and, you know, people say a lot about Hegel as being, you know, the foundation of modern, modern, you know, like, philosophy. You know, Marxism came out of Hegel, you know, Mar Karl Marx considered himself Hegelian, and, you know, I'm not quite sure how that all works, but, I, and again, I'm really not that qualified to be talking about Western philosophy the way I am, so I probably should change the subject now. So, um, that's all actually very clear about all that. If I'm right, which I might not be, because I'm not qualified to talk about it. Um, <laughs> But I'm still not clear the difference between, I mean, there's a nuance between phenomenology and epistemology. Oh. That well, epistemology is generally how you know truth, right? And a phenomenological explanation to that would be that you can't know it outside of your own experience. So in a sense, phenomenology would be a way of saying that, you know, your own experience, truth has to be within the realm of your experience. So phenomenology is just a... An, option of a Yeah, well, it's hard to imagine epistemology without phenomenology. I mean, because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're knowing truth, it's happening within the, it's a phenomenal truth. Yeah. In a sense, you can't know a nominal truth. That's kind of Kant's argument, is that you can't know it. Hegel doesn't necessarily accept that. He has a, 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 a more, um, a less pessimistic approach. I mean, like, where it's like, no, you can actually know things objectively, and actually that's what science is kind of based on. Yeah. And science, in a way, says, look, we're doing it. But then also science will admit, but everything's a theory. We actually don't know things. Science are not, they, they don't make apodictic statements in science. You know, they don't. That's why they call it theory. Exactly. Theories <laughs> and probability and a chance are this going to happen, but we don't know for sure because we just simply cannot factor in all the data, which is the problem with objective thinking. It's more of a matter of limited perspective, you know. Um, but anyway, I'm getting a little outside of myself here. So um, let's back up to Chaitanya. So um, so Chaitanya is, is coming around in this... Um, this intellectual environment where the Mahayanas have kind of basically pretty much left India. You know, it's kind of died out in India. And um, 
and the Advaitins basically kicked their butts. Because in a way, um, in a way what, what the Advaitins did is they took like the kind of genius of the Mahayanist arguments and they incorporated a lot of that, you know, because in a way Advaita is very consistent with that. But then they managed to incorporate that while maintaining the two things that everybody loves, and that's God and soul. If you want to have an unsuccessful philosophical school, start telling people that there's no God and there's no soul, right? You will appeal to an intellectual elite people who can actually follow the amount of, you know, mental logistic gymnastics that you're going to do to prove that, in which you may be successful. But when push comes to shove, people are just not going to accept that because, you know, you are a first person subjective experience and it's, you know, it's hard. People just won't believe that, you know, it's like people, there's like this inherent need to it. I feel, I feel, and I just say this based on, you know, my, my knowledge of history, you know, it's like anybody who comes along is like, there's no soul, you know, they just think it's my appeal, but then sooner or later people are like, nah, you know, it's just like the populace, the force of the populace will never accept no matter how much genius is behind that intellectual elite. So far, maybe not though, maybe, well they say religion is, uh, was supposed to be dead by now based on the assumptions of where the philosophy was in the early part of the 20th century, you know, oh religion's dead but somehow it keeps hanging on and I suspect it's going to be part of that. So anyway, what happens is that the Hindu systems uh, become dominant mostly because they uh, incorporate some elements of the Mahayana Buddhist system by all maintaining a soul and a god. The Mahayana systems leave India. Advaita becomes dominant, and then people back up and they say, well, actually, we don't like this because it's still a little too much like Buddhism. The idea that we don't have an individual self, and there's not really a god. I mean, to say everything's self, everything's, you know, there's a certain absurdity to the word blue if I say everything's blue, right? If that's blue, that's blue, that's blue. We don't even need the word blue. Why do we need the word blue? If everything's blue, it doesn't mean anything anymore, right? So, in a sense... By saying everything is God, you kind of actually kill God. You, you just make it like not even. And this is one of the arguments against pantheism, right? Is pantheism's like once you say God is in everything and everything is God, it's like well no, we don't really need we don't even need it anymore, you know. And this is why panentheism becomes uh, compelling, right? So this is what Ch Chaitanya does. He comes along and he creates panentheism. Whereas, it, uh, whereas Advaita becomes a pantheist perspective where God is everything, everything's God, it's a monistic perspective, everything's one. It's like, then why are you even, you know, then what's so interesting? You know, what's so interesting? Everything's one. You know, big deal, you know. Um, so, so what starts to happen is, that, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little bit too much with, um, with Chaitanya, but first we should mention Madhva and Ramanuja, you know. Madhva says, no, everything's dual. And he kind of takes like almost this yoga sutra sankhya sort of way of dealing with the issue. And then Ramanuja, of course, decides to be the good guy in the room, you know, and he says, oh, you're both right, you know. And he comes up with what's called Vaishishta Advaita. It's a qualified, it's Advaita, yes, but. Everything's one, yes, but. Everything's two. You know, it's like, oh, yes, I accept your arguments of Shankara. You're right. This is the best way to beat somebody in argument is to accept their argument <laughs> and then say, but. Oh, you're, you're totally right, <laughs> but that's the best way, you know, and this is how he does it. And this uh, Ramanuja comes up with this, and then it springs into several different schools of uh, this type of, and then also what Ramanuja also does is he brings the theology back on the scene. He says, I'm going to take this really, really, he becomes a very important thinker because he takes this very, very intense philosophical position and yet manages to turn it into a theological school, Sri uh, Sri Vaishnav school, the Sri Vaishnav school, right? So he starts bringing this bhakti stuff back in, and then Chaitanya, in a sense, goes full blown with this, where he actually flips it upside down. You know, if maybe, maybe I can say this, if maybe for Ramanuja, the philosophy is, center, is central, and theology is part of that, is supportive. He kind of flips it the other way, where Chaitanya's like, yeah, philosophy, cool, we can talk about this all day long, make it make sense, but that's a pretty low place to be. Let's go up to our heart, because the most comprehensive approach to divinity is through love, not knowledge. Knowledge is always creating a model of reality, whereas love is subjectively living in that reality, right? So this is the argument of the, of the Chaitanya school, right? We assume Chaitanya made this argument, but really we actually don't really know because Chaitanya only wrote eight things, and it's the Shikshastika, right? Um, but 
who created the Chaitanya school of, uh, of Vaishnavism? Well, the first one is the Panchatattva, right? There are Chaitanya and his bros who create a populist movement. And then there's the theologians, the Goswamis, right? Of this, the junior one is Jiva Goswami. And being junior is a really nice place to be because this is always this tension in, um, you know, like I said to my, uh, to my uh, Advaita teacher, I said, she's talking about, you know, Vedanta, Vedanta, as if Advaita Vedanta is the only Vedanta, right? And so at a certain point I correct that. I said, well, I just think everybody should be aware that there are many schools of Vedanta, right? Not just everything is one. That's one perspective, you know? Um, and she comes back with, oh, yeah, yeah, but those were just later editions. You know, Shankar was first, <laughs> right? So I mean, there's this one tension where it's like, you're, this is what fun, this is what this is what the definition of fundamentalism is, is that everything else was added on, there was a fundamental origin, and the things value is relevant. The the value of something is based upon its comparison to the fundamental. That's what fundamentalism is. So I say that she was a fundamentalist, an Advaitic fundamentalist, and people start thinking, oh, she put on masks and starts killing Americans. You know, that's not what fundamentalist means. Fundamental is simply the, it's an axiomatic argument, that there's an axiom, and something is good only insofar as it's consistent with the axiom. That's all fundamentalism is. It's an axiomatic argument, right? Um, and so... That's one tension, you know, so people want to base the value of something, how old, well, this is consistent with the Vedas, you know, where are you going to go from there, it's nothing older, right? You know, and if you can do that, then you've got the most legitimacy. However, there's the other tension, and this is the one I just said, it's the yes, but, you know. Actually, really, if you want to win the argument, you kind of go the other way, and you'd be the last guy to talk, right? First guy says his position, second guy beats him, and then you come along <coughs> and you clean up. Right? So in a sense, if you really actually want to win the law argument, you want to be the last guy, not the first guy. Because everybody can take the older argument and beat it. You know, it's, it's, it's a funny privileged position that you have in time. Like right now, you have a very privileged position. And that you can go back to any of the previous philosophers and destroy them, and they can't do anything about it. You know, they can't do anything about it. Hegel's not going to come back and do anything about it. You may have some neo-Hegel person who will try something, but... You're in a very privileged temporal position, you know, so you all use it. So in a way, Chaitanya is using this privileged position, you know, Jiva Goswami is using this privileged position to kind of obliterate, you know, Adi Shankara, you know, uh, and again, that's the majority of the rhetoric is directed at Adi Shankara. Okay, so keeping in mind Hegel's dialectic and keeping in mind the intellectual environment of, I want to say, hostility towards Advaita, there's still a lot of hostility towards Advaita amongst non-Advaitic schools of Hinduism. And I think a lot of that is kind of the defensiveness of the underdog. You know, like, um, Advaita is just so dominant that it's so hard to get away from that. People who are like, you know, part of non-Advaitic schools who don't really know their philosophy will have Advaitic tendencies whether they like it or not. I mean, it's just so hard. Like, the New Age movement is very hard to get, like, Advaitic away from that. Like, anything. Even Buddhists will say things that are so Advaitic, you know. Um, and so it's very, very, it becomes this very dominant force. It's just so easy to take any argument down to, well, separation's an illusion anyway. You know, it's so easy to take it down. And in a sense, it's, it's true. It's true. That's why it's so compelling, because it is true. But, you know, and that's what we, that's what they keep wanting to do, okay? And so Jeeva Goswami has this yes, but approach to theology. And this is what we're seeing here with uh, Bhagavata Sandarbha, okay? So Jiva Goswami, again, becomes one of the six main uh, theologians of um, the Goswamis of, of the Chaitanya tradition, which I, I may be saying that wrong to say he's the sixth main because there's some later guys. Um, it was a Balaba Vibhushana, and there's like some other guys who really become very important. Oh, well, hell, you know, um, uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was very important. You know, there's a lot of later guys, but we're thinking like kind of the early guys who systematized the, uh, the theology. The guys who were like, wow, what Chaitanya did is really cool we better turn this into a religion or it's just going to disappear. You know, well, how are we going to do it? We need doctrine, right? And so he's responding to his uncle a lot. His uncle is Rupa Goswami, you know. 
Um, and he has a privileged position because he's coming after all these dudes. So he's really in a very, very privileged position historically because he has a he can respond to everybody and turn into this really brilliant system. You know? So Jiva Goswami writes the Bhagavata Sandarbha. Notice the ta at the end, Bhagavata versus the Bhagavat Sandarbha, which is just one of the chapters. Bhagavata Sandarbha is also known as Shat Sandarbha. Shat Sandarbha means six Sandarbhas. Sandarbhas are like the chapters. So there's six chapters, right? Okay, for those of you who've survived my quizzes on our long drive to Daria, you know this stuff very well, all right? Sandarbha is, the, the Bhagavata Sandarbha has been divided into five, uh, <laughs> three sections, right? The three sections are the Sambanda, topic, the Abhideya, the means, and the Pradyojana, the goal. The topic, the means, and the goal. All right? The topic becomes really important because if you notice, there's four chapters dedicated to that, and then there's one chapter uh, dedicated to each respective section or theme. Okay? Um, Sambanda, topic, abhideya, means Pradyojana, goal. I actually think I just friended a guy on that. Facebook, whose name was Prem Prayojan, right? Prem Prayojan. It's a very common thing to say, right? Prem Prayojan. Right? Yeah, Prayojana. All right? Uh, Prema, Prayojana in the Sanskrit accent, right? Um, so the topic is Krishna, the means is Bhakti, and the goal is love, Prema. Right? What are we talking about? Krishna. Right? What do we have to do to figure that out? Bhakti. And where are we going to go once we get that? Prema, love. Krishna, devotion, love. All right? And so this becomes the uh, sadhana. This is sadhana. The sadhya is uh, Krishna. Right? The sadhana is bhakti. Right? And you can kind of, in a sense, see all of these as bhakti. Because when we talk about bhakti yoga, we're talking about knowing Krishna doing bhakti so we can get love in a sense you know so we can get love actually the irony there is that you can't get love you have to give love and then you get it <laughs> the only way to get love is to give it right there's no way of getting love there's only giving love and then the the effect of that <laughs> the side effect of giving love that's all there is there's no such thing as there's no such thing as getting love there's only lo giving love and the side effect of giving love which we you know, might call getting love erroneously. We might call it that. All right. So the chapters are based, uh, basically divided up into that. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of go through the chapters and give a little um, synopsis about this. Uh, really, what's interesting to me is how this is responding largely to Advaita. Right. This is what becomes interesting with this. All right. Um, before I do that, just to finish off the structure. Um, what he proposes is a threefold, uh, Jiva Goswami pro proposes a threefold approach to the Absolute. One is Brahman, the other is Paramatma, and the other one is Bhagavan. Right. Um, uh, Brahman is the Advaita level. This is the Upanishads. When we say the Atman and Brahman are one and everything is one, you're realizing Brahman. So in this way, yes. You are right, Advaita. But, Paramatma. Paramatma is that there is God in all things. And these things are separate. But yet there's God within them. Right? This is what we saw in the Bhagavata Purana with the Mula. And the, uh, what was the other one? Bija. Mula and Bija of the Purusha. The Bhagavata Purana in the Gajendra chapter talks about uh, the Gajendra supposedly praising the Lord, but actually he's really just teaching you <laughs> kind of Abhideya or kind of a Sambandha in a sense, right? Uh, he says, I'm worshipping that Supreme Lord who's the Mula of the Purusha and the Bija of the Purusha. Mm -hmm. So remember in Yoga Samkhya, you get back to your Purusha, that's as far as you can go, right? And that's why it's not that theological. It's because God is like an object of meditation to get you to that as far as you can go place. You know, the eschatology is that you're going towards that Prussian, that's where you end up, right? That's your telios, 
Purusha, that's it. That's all you get. But then the Puranic traditions say, oh, yes, but. <laughs> yes, you're right, Prakriti and Purusha. But behind that Purusha, the root of that Purusha, the seed of that Purusha is God. So it creates this funny thing where you go within to get without, right? Uh, you go all the way into yourself to realize that yourself is one with everything else. There's like this point where you're actually realizing the aggregate, which is Brahman, right? So uh, Brahman is the oneness, but there's also the individualization of that, which becomes your, your Purusha. We'll call it Purusha for now, just because it's easier than to try to distinguish between the various different semantic uses of the word Atman. You know, Purusha, tends, Purusha and Jiva tend to mean the individual soul, as opposed to Atman, can be, it can be mean either the individual soul or the aggregated Vedic soul, right? So the term of Atman becomes much more vague uh, than the term, like, Jiva. You know, very few people are going to talk about Jiva as like a collective Jiva. You know, it usually means an individual soul, right? It literally means life, right? You're the individual living thing in that sense. All right, so the Brahman is the acceptance of the Advaitic argument that everything's one. Yes, you're right. And we'll even go so far as to call that Brahma Jyotir. Brahma Jyotir. Right? Jyoti, um, Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityu Vardhma, Asatoma, Sagamaya, Tamasoma, Jyotir Gamaya, Tamasoma, Jyotir Gamaya. Gamaya, let me lead me from, from uh, Tamas to Jyoti. From darkness to light, you know. Remember, light is a very important concept. The elves in the last uh, Hobbit movie, right? To us, light is the most important thing. Right? To us, light is the most important thing. It's the most sacred thing. It's so beautiful, because that's how it is in the Indian you know, stuff. Consciousness is light, right? Stupidity is darkness, right? You know, uh, what makes something consciousness? The quality of light within it. It's the light inside it that makes it. Which kind of makes sense if everything comes from like sun. You know, sun creates the plants, we eat the plants, we get, you know, like in a sense everything is, in a biological sense, we're all part of the same light system in a way, you know. So um, and we're all stardust anyway, which is what is stardust if it's not light. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, so the part of the Mahatma, the Brahma is, yes, everything's one, Brahma Jyotir. And the analogy becomes rays of sun to sun, right? In your spiritual journey, you can either turn your back to the sun and look at your own shadow and follow material existence, which is one of darkness. It's one where you think you're getting something, but all you're getting is the illusion of something, the shadow. Right? You think you're getting happiness, but all you're getting is the shadow of happiness. It feels like happiness when you look at it. Like you look at your shadow, you might think, oh, look, there's some guys standing there. You know? But you realize that that's not right. So maybe you turn around and you start going towards the sun and you realize that oh wait a minute but you don't actually see the sun you see the sunlight and you go wait a minute here I'm part of this sunlight I'm one with all of this this is all sun is creating all of this all even the shadow is like the other side of sun you know it's it's all sun, sun creates the shadow so everything must be sun this oneness right this is what Brahma is you dissolve the sense that you disintegrate your sense of uh, of individuality, and you realize that you are just the sun ray, right? Oh, the ray of sun comes down, feeds the plants, makes the earth, makes the universe, creates the spin of the plants. All of that, we must all be sun ray. There must be no self, Brahma Jyotir, right? But then we get to Bhagavan, right? Bhagavan, we turn our head even farther, and we look up, and we go, wait a minute, there's the sun. And guess what? It is different than us. I'm the sun ray. There's a truth. There's a oneness to who I am. I'm the sun ray. But I'm also apart from the supreme Bhagavan. Okay? So this becomes this uh, kind of like Hegelian dialectic. Yes, we're all one. Uh, we're all separate. And at the root of all that separateness is the God. And then actually the God is totally separate, you know? So in a sense, you know, it kind of incorporates all of this. Some like quantum mechanics. It's very quantum mechanics. Like. theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, the interesting thing is that how, you know, like people want to argue with science, with religion based on the science in the religious texts. It's like, 
but the thing is, is you're not you're arguing modern science with ancient science. If you're talking about creation, oh, creation couldn't have happened like that. Water could have never been created first. In the beginning, there was water or something. Now, how could that happen? That's not possible. Let me show you. Well, you're not arguing science against religion. You're just new science against old science. You know, that's what you're doing with that, right? Um, so what happens is the, 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 the religious process is one of incorporating the science of the time into the religion of the time. And that's what's always happened, right? And so it's very interesting to think what quantum mechanics is going to do for our religion. But what is quantum mechanics? Achintya beda beda. Yes. Wave particle duality. This paradox is achintya at the most fundamental place in reality. Hope needs to get back here because she's got to hear this. Okay, so listen. Yesterday, my professor made an analogy between intelligence and quantum mechanics. All right? This is a really, really important idea. Ho! Oh! Yesterday, my professor made an analogy between intelligence and quantum mechanics. All right? He says intelligence is a hard thing to understand because it doesn't move by the causal forces of Newtonian mechanics. In other words, intelligence is weird because it doesn't seem to work deterministically. I could either pick blue or green randomly. There's not, you can't trace that back to a causal thing that maybe decided to pick that up right now. Right? It's very hard to see. And guess what? That's what quantum mechanics is as well. Quantum mechanics has the property of intelligence, right? Intelligence is the fact that you can move outside of causal relationships. You can kind of be like, I'm just going to randomly, as a matter of fact, you can do something uncausally. The cause will make one person do this and cause will make the other, same cause makes the other person do something completely different. This is what intelligence is. And he makes the analogy of how the birds move in a flock. There's no way of knowing why they're all going to, s all of them, suddenly turn that direction. They have a collective intelligence. They could turn there. They could turn there. There's no causal thing that you can find. There's no one bird causing that either. It's this collective intelligence. Intelligence has the same qualities as quantum mechanics in the sense that it seems to just kind of do its own thing. And he makes the analogy of this experiment where they shoot a laser through a small hole and one time it will make this electron jump and another time it will make this electron jump. And they're not really sure why it is that sometimes it does this and sometimes it does that. It seems to be random. Randomness is an attribute of intelligence where we find something moving outside the realm of causal relationships we can see that as being intelligence because in a sense what's happening a choice is being made choice is the definition of random right it could be informed it could have causes but it doesn't have to somebody has to turn on the laser for either this electron to jump or that electron to jump but we don't know why one or the other jumped. It won't happen without the laser. There is some causation there. Again, there's causation, but there's also not causation as well, too. Again, we have a dialectic. We have, yes, there's a cause, but also, no, there's not a cause. They're both true, right? And then what happens in the valence field of an electron is the valence an electron does not occupy a point in a valence field. It's not in a singular place because that would be deterministic. That would be... Newtonian mechanics. It's there because it's caused to be there. It has a tendency. It's a wave of probability, right? So what happens is when you shoot the laser, there's a probability that this or that will happen. You don't know for sure. All you can do is state it in terms of probability, and the randomness will happen within the confines of that probability. The same way we're not really sure where the electron is in the valence field, it's a wave of probability. It has a tendency to occupy this area. It's not suddenly going to be over there, but it's, it's not so random, but it's not so predictable either. Again, we got this achintya beda, this Hegelian dialectic. So what we start having is that we start looking at reality in a different way, where the fundamentals, what we can consider to be fundamental to intelligence, and what we consider to be fundamental to material reality actually have the exact same quality. So if they're the same, if it's an appositional relationship, if you say x equals y, 
You can take out the y and put in two x's and the equation still means the same thing. So in this sense, we can kind of almost view the foundation of reality as being intelligent. Conscious maybe, right? I'm not sure how much you want to turn intelligence into consciousness and subjective and all that other thing. We, I don't know. But, you know, uh, so this becomes a very, very, very Did interesting thing that's happening. that name again? Which one? Uh, your my professor's name. My professor's name is uh, Pradushottama, the highest Pradusha. Pradushottama Bilmoria, B-I-L-I-M-O-R-I-A. Um, I don't know where he gets all that from. Uh, you know, it's I've, not Bill Moria? No, it's Billy, Billy Moria. Oh, I, all this time I thought it was Bill Moria. Well, yeah, he says it, Bill Moria, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the I is like, and I don't even know what kind of, because Purdue Shotama is about as India as you can get, but Bill Moria sounds like it has some sort of Italian or Latin, or I don't know where that all comes from. I asked him where he's from, he said Australia. I said, Australia? <laughs> he says, yeah, and then India before that, but Australia. Okay, I mean, he's just kind of like he's one of these like he's like me, you know. He wants to he wants to he wants to agitate, you know. The thing you're expecting, he's not going to give you. If he finds that you have a button, he will push it. You know? He's the, and I love that kind of guy. You know, the other day he says, "I'm a nihilist." You know, somebody said, "What's your religious view?" He says, "Oh, I'm a nihilist." He says, "I'm going to build a temple to nihilism." I figure if the Buddhists can have a temple to emptiness, I can have a temple to nihilism. What's the difference? You know. And then, of course, the next class, I'm thinking, this guy's a nihilist, but he's talking about the fundamentals of reality as being intelligent. No, you can't do that if you're a nihilist. He was just, you know, that's just who he is. It's like sophistry, right? Sophistry is like whatever you say, I'm going to take the opposite position. You know, whatever you think you're holding on to, I'm going to go the other way. You know, the sophistry, right? But this is something. But sophistry usually means like a like a, an unethical argument. It's like, it's come to mean that like, oh, like a, like, plants feel pain the same way animals do, right? This could be considered a sophistic argument. Like, how could you really believe that? You're just saying that to, like, somehow enforce your point or just to kind of, like, take us on some red herring or, you know, like, how could you? That's like a sophistic argument. It's like a, you know, it's one that's, like, not really an honest intention. It's like you're just arguing. And it comes from the sophists, which were a Greek school, which were known for playing as the devil's advocate all the time. Like, that's how they practice their exert, their, their, uh, their, their logic. Which is a really great way. You all sit in the room, whatever I say, you say something opposite, I'll say, you know, I mean, you're going to get a really strong brain like this, you know. It doesn't mean you necessarily believe that's what means devil advocate. It doesn't mean you really believe it. So that's the sophistry. Why am I talking about that? Uh, but, you know, that's what I meant. It's like, it's a sophistic argument, but, um, but not in the sense it's a dishonest one just to confuse things. But in a way, it's, he's a, he's a, he's a philosopher. Beyond anything, he's a philosopher. So, of course, he wants you to work your logic. Okay, so if so I could go back, go back yeah, yeah. to the relationship between intelligence, quantum physics, and that thing. And Man, I wish I had more to say about that, but I really don't. Are we done with that? I felt uh, like we were done. That is the extent of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, the only thing that I can add is that you know when he started talking like this, I started asking him about Galen Strawson, you know. Um, and Galen Strassen makes the argument that I've, I've proposed in here several times is that consciousness is fundamental to reality instead of an evolute out of reality. Um, that is to say, it's absurd to talk about non-conscious matter bumping into each other until it somehow pulls out consciousness. You know, then the, then the absurdity to that is at what point does that happen? The second uh, molecules become a DNA, is that when it happens? Is the second DNA becomes a cell, is that when it happens? Is the second two cells come together and create a tissue, is that when it happens? Is the second that there's a uh, tissue that's created an organ, is that when it happens? Is the second that organ systems happen, is that when it happens? Is it the second that there's a brain stem that that happens? Is it the second there's a nervous stem? Where on earth is the point where uh, enough dumb matter comes together to make smart matter? When does that happen? How is that? You know, and that becomes like this kind of... Um, you know, this argument for, against materialism in the sense, too. You know, so, so if that's true, that dumb matter can't bounce together enough to create smart matter, then it also makes sense that the source of your own consciousness can't be your material brain. Like, how could consciousness come from something not conscious? Right, it's the absurdity of that argument. Like, how could I have, like, there's so, it's like, it's like how, do I, how do I plant an apple tree and get an orange out of it? You know, that's not possible. So consciousness must be this thing that's fundamental to the universe and is kind of moving it around in various different complexities to the point where you're able to get the degree of subjectivity 
there may be varying degrees of subjectivity based on complexity or something, but the conscious thing itself must be fundamental, which makes a little bit more sense to like when we start talking about uh, like the fundamentals of reality in terms of quantum mechanics and the fundamentals of intelligence seem to be the same thing. In that sense, maybe that's true, right? So that kind of almost seems consistent with Galen Strassen's argument. But of course, the second I proposed this Galen Strassen argument to my professor, he says, oh, no. <laughs> Even though, like a minute ago, it seemed like you were saying something right along the lines of that. He says, no, no, it's not unthinkable to think of consciousness as a function of complexity, and as things get more complex, they become conscious. Says, oh, yeah, I guess I don't really have reason to not believe that either, you know? I mean, uh, it's, it's like you were saying, it's apples and oranges. Well, I, I'm a little more persuaded by the former argument, especially when we start talking about intelligence and quantum mechanics having the same essential property. Like... I'm more inclined to think that consciousness is fundamental and how can you get the apple tree out of the orange tree. Now that's how I'm more inclined, but I can't say for sure that consciousness isn't a function of just complexity. If things get complex enough, they get conscious. I mean, I can't say for sure that either. And just because you can't find the point where that happens doesn't mean that it's not like a, a, a varying degree. It's like, you know, it's not like there's not a spectrum, you know, just because there's not a line doesn't mean that it can't be this kind of continuous process. So I can't really disprove that either. My inclination is to go with the f former, but uh, yeah. I don't even know what to say here. Here we go. <laughs> so I've heard often that 95% of the people on the planet believe in a divine presence or power. It doesn't necessarily mean they're religious, organized religious or whatever. And then you said that religion kind of was dying. Well, I don't know if it is or and not. It was it was ex so, it was predicted to be dead by now. Right, predicted to be dead by now. Yeah. So my question is where are we headed? Um what I think where I think we're headed is where exactly what I said earlier. I think we're headed to the point where we're figuring out how to incorporate our latest science of the day with our latest religion of the and day. And how is that multiculturalism? Not Pluralism. How is this that is not new. materialism rubbing up against itself to become conscious? Like humanity waking up? It, it might be. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I have a hard time with what I call the progress myth, the idea that we're actually getting any smarter I or better. That's why I, I, I tend to think we're just doing more things in different combinations. You know, like I don't think that we're, I mean, I hate to say this because I do feel like I'm a new age person. And the assumption of the new age, I mean, if you can reduce new age fundamentalism, if you will, uh, <laughs> the fundamental quality of the new age movement is its very name, that there will be a new age, that we have been in this stupid age, and that's finally going to turn into uh, a new, better, like we're going to have this mass awakening. And this comes from the, the, the interaction between the Theosophical Society in the Indian religion where they learned about the Yuga system. Yeah. And like, oh man, we're in Kali Yuga, Kurta Yuga's around the corner, cool. Right. And then all this kind of Aquarian stuff kind of came out of that stuff, this idea that we, we're actually asleep right now, we're going to have this mass awakening. Um, again, I, I, I do consider myself a new ager, but I also may not make that as a strong ontological position. I may say that I like the epistemological, the subjective value of that story. It doesn't have to be true in order for me to like the value of it, you know? I like the idea that we're all going to wake up. And you know what? I'm going to proceed on that damn assumption. The same way I'm going to proceed on the assumption that if I do good things now, I'm going to be reborn in a better way. It could completely not be true. But you know what? It's true subjectively because it does something to my experience. And that's real. And as a matter of fact, that's the only thing that I can apodictically say is real. You know, I can never say anything objectively what happens after de death for sure, but I can say for sure what that story makes me feel. So in that sense, because it is a completely 100% truth that I'm feeling that, that is completely 100% true more than science can ever be. Because science is always going to be an approximation of truth. Sorry, I think she was first. Is that a little bit like the placebo effect? Uh, I don't know how. Well, you believe it to be true, and it makes yeah. it true. Yeah. Um, Do you believe that this is no, true? no, because 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 placebo effect is going to be something that's um, objectively able to calculate. You know, you're not taking the placebo because you want to feel like you're better. You want to take the placebo because it's going to make you better. You know. But how do you? 
how do you know that you've been made better versus well, you? Well, that's easy. That's just a matter of... I got kind of the same question. Right? It's not a lot of science. Yeah. It's easy. Same thing. It's no. easy to quantify. No, I feel like shit today. Oh, take this. Oh, I feel better. Well, you feel better, but somehow you still can't get out of bed. And no, yet you, you still you have, better, and you, you still have snot coming out of your nose, and you're still coughing and choking, and no, and you it's, still it's, can't quite make it through an eight-hour day of work because you're saying, and you're still it, infecting the guy next to you, but yet you still feel better. It depends on this what is, you're talking about. Well, this you is know? what this is what I mean. No, there's plenty of placebos. Take this pill and well, you'll be this is a different this is a different argument about whether the placebo effect well, is what so people don't. think it is. And my, what, I, what I learned in college when I took my critical thinking class from the guy who specialized in critical thinking is that he said, his name's Mulder, he, uh, he said that the placebo effect is the most overblown thing in the world and that it like increases your healing process by like that much. Not even worth talking about. I think it depends know? on... It may be different for psychology. Yeah. It may be like, totally I was depressed, I gave you a placebo, I believed I was not depressed. Anyway, it might be way more effective than yeah. like... I mean, the, the, because psychology is a subjective experience that we're measuring, as opposed to something objective like whether you're sick or not. Hey, uh, who, can you pause this real quick? I have a question. Yeah. Well, one, why not just use the placebo... So the question is about how collective consciousness works, right? So um, I was watching Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, Cosmos with Hope the oh, other day. Such a great I watched it for like show. thirty minutes, and I had oh, so much to think about. Netflix, highly recommend. Um, so, Cosmos, really so cool. what he was saying is that, um, in a sense, he was proposing that relativity destroyed the idea of subjectivity. Is, is more or less what he was saying. He was saying that it used to be that everybody was their own little center in the world. And that everything was happening based on this like individual subjective center, and you know he kind of used the principles of physics to show that actually we really don't have any subjectivity at all, and everything's completely relative. And then he goes on to say, but it doesn't mean that there are no absolutes. He says the absolute is the speed of light. Right? It's completely stable. So individual subjectivity is not stable, according to him. Uh, not a stable, not a singular process, you know, not like what we would say in the uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Ajo Nityo Shashvato Yam Pradano Na Hanyate Hanyamane Sharide, unborn Ajo Nityo, permanent Ajo Nityo Shashvato, enduring Pradano, hell ancient Na Hanyate Hanyamane Sharide, it's not killed when the body's killed, right? So Neil deGrasse Tyson says, well, according to physics, that's not really true. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing that's ajo nityo shashvato yam parano. Well, the thing that is ajo nityo shashvato yam parano is the speed of light. Right? It's not an individual subject thing, but it is an absolute. right? And then when we start talking about this consciousness experiment that we're talking about, this is a, a universal, this is not indifferentiated. When we're talking about laws, this is actually the cool thing about Kant or Descartes, because keep in mind that Descartes had all this stuff to say about subjectivity and, uh, and the duality of the soul versus matter. Why? Because of his understanding of math. You know, uh, that becomes very interesting because the relationship between these things started real. I think it really got heavy with Descartes, you know. Um, but math, in a sense, is kind of like one plus one is always going to be two. There's nothing you can do about it, you know. <laughs> It's a Jo Nityo Shashvato Yam Parano, right? So at what point does that thing become a uh, subject? We're at, the, we're at the level of kind of Brahmin way of thinking about this, right? These are like these, no matter where you go in our universe, 186,000 speed uh, per second, one plus one is two. A Jo Nityo Shashvato Yam Parano. It's like, there, there's no differentiating that. In a sense, that's universal. What is the one universal in our universe? Speed of light, right? Um, and from that comes things like, uh, uh, the unification of the space-time continuum. Uh, Time-space is being time and space. Geography and temporality being the same thing. Just something they've been saying in India forever, right? Um, but in a way, the, uh, because the speed of light is not conditioned by space or time, it's also the thing that's outside of space-time. And even though it's describing like speed, but then, the subs then space is this amorphic one substance. Space-time is a substance. It's not an emptiness. So again, the Buddhists were kind of wrong, according to modern mechanics. Uh, Space-time is this glob. We're, we are operating in this 
cytoplasm. <laughs> like we're in this glob of space-time thing that's just moving things around from here to there. It's never disappearing. It's never increasing. Again, we all have Brahman, 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 this and this one. If when we start talking about this fundamental quantum mechanics is having the same quality of intelligence and that it seems to move randomly, it has an ability to step outside a causal relationship, Newtonian mechanics, general relativity, and move on its own. Again, we have this kind of, this, this universalized principle. You know, so this is Brahman, right? This is Brahman. This is, in a sense, we could call all of this some sort of collective, because the collective is that it's true, but is not individuated, right? So if we can equate consciousness with the speed of light and the the ability to move improbably and the quantum mechanics, if we can somehow equate all of that, in a sense, we do have a collective conscious that may explain why all the birds decide to turn at once, because they are thinking with the same. Collect. They're tapped into the same undifferentiated source of consciousness, yeah, and this is kind of goal. What's that? I think that's the goal of humanity. Well, tune into that. and Jiva Goswami, yes, that's one goal. One goal. But there's more to there's it more. than that, right? I mean, this is what's going on with what Jiva Goswami is. He's kind of appending uh, uh, that because he is saying there is subjectivity as well, too, right? Um, and I think that there is subjectivity too as well. There's a separation of yourself, and there's also a separation of uh, God, I think, is a way of saying, but yet the electron still moves in the valence field. It may be random, but it's causally random. You know? There's, it's still an electron. It's not a proton. It's still its own part of the It still is a separate thing. It's still a different... You can't just let it degenerate into this all-is-one sort of thing. You know? Yes, space, time, blah, 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 but yes, also electron, proton, neutron, quark, neutrino, whatever. But yes, also that as you well. You said too. causally random. <laughs> yeah, causally random. Did I say that? You said that. That's it, right? It's causally <laughs> random. Did I say that? Yes. <laughs> Somebody write that down. I wrote, I wrote it down. Somebody write that down. Y'all are missing this I stuff. I wrote it down. I'm getting gems out here. <laughs> causally random. Yeah, it's causally random, right? Because it's, it's random within certain frameworks of causation, right? So that's part of the and then Bhagavan is kind of like, it's all of that, you know? Um, so anyway, let me, just, let me just move through the rest of this before I keep going off on that. And I mean, I could very easily keep going into consciousness and subjectivity. And in a sense, it is all related to this, but... It just, um, I'm sorry, this is a bad racial joke on top of that question. <laughs> The threefold absolute, not it seems to not only happen conceptually in, in, in this system, but I see it culturally happening as well on the planet. Like, this is so horrible, I'm going to say it though. Not all black people love watermelon. Black people have no a way. tendency to like. Okay, can we pan the camera over and just make <laughs> sure that this you know everybody knows there's an African American I asking this question because white people are not allowed to ask You're this not question. Not allowed to ask people. that question, but do you see the racial, um, <sighs> the cultural aspect? <laughs> I, yeah, see, I'm qualified to say that. I'm also allowed to say another word. But okay, 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 okay. I'm gonna drop that, all right? Because I'm I'm out of time right now, and I'm gonna I'm move on sorry. to something else. It, 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 this could be a whole other thing, but let's not, okay? Okay. So um so so then we talk about Bhagavan, right? Sorry. And so 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 first of all, let me let me just let me just let me look at the larger frame of all of this, and that is that we're talking about categories, aspects. You know, all of this is a rebuttal, an indirect and a subtle rebuttal to the oneness of Advaita. Because Advaita will fundamentally say, no, no, that's not true. Because actually that's an adhyasa, that's a, a, an illusion. Really everything is one. Sure. So Advaita is going to keep coming back to this. You know, you can talk about Ram Parali, yeah, 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 you're all, yeah, okay, that's, that's cute, but that's a function of your own avidya. Your ignorance is what causes a sense of separation. Right? So you can talk about things in terms of separation because they're a, a useful fiction, right? That's what they say, like a, a useful fiction, you know? We're all one true, that's the truth. The, the, the illusion is that we're separate, but really, 
if you're going to get on with your life, let's make let's just go ahead and go with that fiction because it's just going to make things a little easier. But then the question is, well, who cares if it's easier or hard if you're one? You know, like <laughs> why do you want to make it easier? Why do you why do you need a useful fiction? You know, you live, you die. It doesn't matter if you're all one. You never. So anyway, um, so the very fact that we're talking about aspects becomes this kind of subtle rebuttal to Advaita. And uh, actually, um, uh, Ravi M. Gupta, Gupta, who we're going to go here to speak on on Monday. He ta Sunday. or Sunday. He talks about in Tattva Sandarbha in the first uh, chapter of Jiva Goswami's work is this very non-sectarian and very universalist. He doesn't directly contradict Advaita, but he does so in this kind of almost sort of subtle way. You know, if I say no, there's three aspects of God. I'm not saying Advaita is wrong, but at the same time, this is where the tension starts. All right, and when we start talking about the shaktis of God. This becomes a very, very more important thing because according to Advaita, there's no Shakti. There's no Shakti. It's like a, it's like a obliteration of the divine feminine. <laughs> there's no such thing as Shakti, right? Shakti, the idea that there are multiple different energies impelling different things, which is what Shakti is, is an illusion because it's all one. It's actually all this big male god. But actually, really, to be charitable, they would say that the distinctions between masculine and feminine themselves are an illusion. This is where we get our Ardha Nardeshwara depiction of Shiva, where he's half Parvati, half Shiva, you know. So, um, <clears throat> in a sense, it could be seen as like an obliteration of the, uh, the theology of the feminine. But at the same time, you could just as easily say it's an obliteration of the theology of the masculine. Uh, because actually masculine and feminine distinctions are both considered illusion. However, then we're going to call that thing Shiva, which it's kind of hard to get away from that. So wait, wait, let, me, let me finish, let me finish, because i got to get this stuff done. Okay, so uh, we start talking about God's different shaktis, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and again, this becomes a very subtle rebuttal to the Advaita, right? The three shaktis are Maya, Jiva, and Svarup, right? This follows the progression of Veda, Abeda, Abeda. Or excuse me, Veda, 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 Abeda, right? Um, so the Maya Shakti is what we think about as our um, our kind of classic Sankhya Yoga uh, Prakriti, right? Mm -hmm. The Svardhu uh, is kind of you know because we have Tata Dada Svardhu Svardupe Vastanam, right? Mm -hmm. So we think about that as Purusha and Yoga mm -hmm. Sankhya, but we're talking about God, and then Jiva is kind of that spot in between, right? This is who we are. We're Jiva. We are simultaneously one and different from God exactly at the same time. Maya is more Beta. Svardup is more Abeda. I really like to state this in terms of reflective and reflexive. Maya is more reflective. Svardupa is more reflexive. Think about your own consciousness, right? When you stop and say, how do I feel today? You're being very reflective. That's reflection. How do I feel today? You've actually separated yourself to analyze how you said it. That's a a beta. I mean, that's a beta state. You've divided yourself. Let me analyze my behavior. Was I really a jerk earlier? Right? That is a beta position. You're stepping out and reflecting. This is a separation. You're still you. I mean, you're still God. I mean, like all this is still God, but it's God as reflective is Maya. God is reflexive is that you're not even thinking about it. You're just, you're with the flow. You're dancing to the Grateful Dead. It's just coming out. You don't decide I'm going to move my arm like that. It just happens. <laughs> you know? It's a reflective awareness. It's just coming from within and emitting out. This is the Svarupa, right? And then the Jiva is, is the mix of both of those things. And if you think about it, that's what you're doing. You're constantly either reflective or reflexive. Reflective. It's like, I, I don't know, but I kind of wish that there was some way of quantifying whether we spend 50% of our time reflective and 50% reflexive. Because it kind of seems like we're constantly bouncing back and forth between the two. Like if you're going to remember, you're going to go ahead and reflect. Right? But if you're just going to be, you're going to reflex. Right? You're sleeping so, awake. So, yeah, sleeping and waking. You know, it's like everything you do kind of has these two dimensions to it. I'm trying to understand how they relate within ourselves. But anyway, you can think about these three shaktis of the God, of the Lord as being a, this similar problem. I like to talk about it in these terms, right? So then we come to what is Svarup Shakti, right? What is the Svarup? What is God's mm. essential nature? You know, the source of that reflection. You know, for us is maybe light, prakasha, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for the Lord, 
It's the same. Oh, for us, we're, we're also stated as Satchitananda. Right? Satchitananda, we are the power of existence, the power of consciousness, and the power, power of bliss. So at the our own Svarupa, according to Vedanta, not according to Yoga Sankhya, Yoga Sankhya will leave it at shit. Because they don't want more than one thing, because more than one thing implies interactions of things. Interactions of things implies change. Change uh, implies temporal existence. Right? And we're talking about eternal nature. So Yoga Sankhya doesn't like having three things. Right? The Jains believe that your soul is variegated. What's that? Variegated. What's that? It's multiple. There's different things happening in it. The Jains don't accept this. Same thing that Yoga Sankhya does. And then in a sense, the Vedanta position is, hey, yeah, let's keep it as minimal as possible. Your three things. Sat, Chit, Ananda. Right? Uh, existence, consciousness, and bliss. Right? You know, and they're kind of, they work, they work, um, I'm not quite sure what that's called in relationship, but, you know, first it has to exist. It, chit contains existence, and Ananda contains Chit and Sat. You know, um, so... First, something has to exist before it can be conscious. And if something is consciousness, it has to exist. And if something is bliss, it has to have existence and consciousness to be bliss, right? So really, the most complete expression of yourself is Ananda, but with the understanding that in order for Ananda to be, it has to have Sat and Chit. So in a sense, it is still one, you know? You said that steps outside Yoga Samkhya. Well, it does in the sense because we're, we're starting to talk about multiplicity. Yoga really says Chitti. And identifies with... Advaita? Well, this is this is accepted by all uh, schools okay. um, of Vedanta, uh, but I think the Advaitins would say that to think that they're separate is an illusion, and uh, the Advaita Veda would probably say, well, it's both the same and different. I mean, I don't know, you know, um, they probably just, just follow follow their own. Um, so, so in a sense, uh, the Lord has the same distinction within His own Svarupa, and within His own Svarupa, He is Sandini, Sambit, and Khadini, right? Sandini is a uh, the um, the productive, the creative force of God, right? Existing, because I mean, for us, it's existence. To exist, well, God is existing too. God is the source of existence. God is what makes things exist. Something, well, consciousness. You know, God is conscious. He's aware. You know, just like we are. Actually, the source of our awareness is God in a sense. And then Khladini, you could say the same thing. The source of our is Khladini. So where does Khladini? and then I keep saying that the really interesting thing here becomes Radha. Because after all of this, where do we end up with the last thing up here? Khladini Shakti. This is what Sri Radha is. Radha is the perfect, most complete manifestation of the Khladini Shakti of the Lord. She is the very essence of God's ability to feel bliss. You know, God, but not only that, not only is she the Svardupa, but then she becomes externalized in order for him to realize that. You know, the Khaladini energy does nothing if it's inside of you. Khaladini energy only does something when it's externalized. <laughs> so we're back to objective existence. The farther subjective you go, the more you realize that your love will never work unless you have beloved. Right? In order for you to realize your own subjective nature of love, you must have a beloved. To show you that nature. Yes. As a matter of fact, you can't do it by getting love. You can only yes. do it by giving love. And this is what Radha's relationship is to Krishna. Krishna's nothing without Radha. Right? Because he's not even his he can't be his complete self without Radha. His own Svartupa depends on Radha. Right? So who's higher? The god or the goddess? Right. Well, in this case, Krishna says, I am the Shisha. She is, she is the guru. I'm the shisha. And then there's shashi. shashi. I'm getting all these words mixed up. He says, I'm the, I'm the student. She's the teacher. She is my guru. Right? And in this Aww. sense, that's what he means. Aww. He means that he's nothing without her. And this is why Bhagavad Saprana becomes a complete failed experiment for God. Because he realizes, I made the mistake. I was still God. I should have been the devotee. Better try again. And he becomes Lord Chaitanya. Golden Gaura, right? He becomes golden hued. He is Radha. He becomes reborn as Radha, as the devotee of Krishna. So he's simultaneously Radha and Krishna. And what is the characteristic of Shikshastika? This uh, 
Lord Daivami Dursami Hajini Nanuraga. How unfortunate am I that I cannot have a proper attraction to the God. His whole lamentation is that he is no that he is so far away from God. And yet he's the complete principle. Through the externalization, one creates the internalization process. Okay, this is the paradox. And I can't do nearly as much justice as Triprari Maharaj did the other day on Radhashtami when he talked about this process of the external soul. Your soul is external to you. Wow. I mean, he just did such a fantastic job uh, reiterating this dialogical relationship that is your own singular. He's, ah, man, it's beyond anything I can do as eloquently, but that's my feeble attempt right there. Okay, let's close with uh, our prayers, and then we're going to sing. Thank you.